So today we begin chapter 18 of the Gospel of John, where we see the arrest of Jesus. So today I'm going to take up three parts. The first part is the arrest of Jesus. And the second part is Jesus before Annas. And the third part is the denial of Peter. So I'm putting these sections together because the narrative about Annas is in two different places. I'm putting it together. So also the denial of Peter I'm bringing together so that we study them as one whole. So I read from John chapter 18 verse 1 onwards. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Jesus has finished the last supper with his disciples and he is now entering into this garden uh, through the Kidron Valley. Now, <clears throat> this valley has a brook and uh, when Jesus is passing through this place, you know, he can see in this brook, the water is red. Why? Because this is the time of the Passover and uh, we understand from history that thousands and thousands of lambs were slaughtered for the Passover. Sometime after the death of Jesus, there was a census. And that census says, on the day of the Passover, 2,56,000 lambs were slaughtered on the altar. So you can imagine the blood of 2,56,000 lambs that flowed from the altar uh, through a channel into the Kidron Valley. And when Jesus is passing through this Kidron Valley, he can see this place where all this blood is passing through and uh, you know it must have reminded him of his own death on the cross how he will sacrifice himself and how his blood is going to flow freely for the redemption of mankind so it must have been a very poignant moment for jesus as he was crossing the kidron valley and from here he goes to this garden the garden of gethsemane the Garden of Gethsemane, <clears throat> it means uh, the place of olives. You know, there were a lot of olive trees here. And in this place, they also had olive presses. You know, there was these olive presses where oil was extracted from the olives that grew in these hills. And uh, probably <clears throat> Jesus knew somebody here. These places were owned by very rich people. And Jesus would frequent this place with his disciples to have some peace and quiet now and then. So John says Jesus met here often with his disciples. So Jesus now comes here to spend some time in prayer in this garden. And uh, Judas is also familiar with this place. You see? So... Some well-wisher whose name we'll never know has given this place to Jesus and uh, Jesus makes use of this place and his disciples Peter, James and John are there with him and uh, now we have Judas. Now Judas who betrayed him also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Isn't it uh, very strange to see that to arrest one simple Jewish carpenter, we have here a whole band of soldiers. Now, you see, it says... There were some officers from the chief priests. Now, these are the temple police. The temple police were Jewish men who were employed in the temple by the Pharisees. Now, since the Romans were ruling, they also had a band of soldiers. And the 
Greek word used here uh, is indicative of three different meanings. It could mean three different things. That is this band of soldiers could mean a band of 1000 soldiers or 600 soldiers or 200 soldiers. Now, even if we take the smallest number, which is 200, it is still such a huge number considering that they're all going to catch just one simple person who is in who is just a rabbi. Imagine Jesus is like a one one man army now against these band of soldiers and uh, they're all coming to him on a day when it is full moon, when it is nice and bright and there was no need for any light, but they come there with lanterns and torches and weapons. You know why? Because they think the person they're going to catch is probably hiding behind some bushes or he is hiding in a cave or hiding behind some trees. And so they come with lanterns and torches to really search him out. But you know what happens? Jesus is not someone who is hiding. Jesus is there out in the open. So when we read this passage, you know, a lot of things come to our mind when we read this. <clears throat> Let's see. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. Of those whom thou gavest me, I lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? So, in this small passage, you know, we read it every time when we go to church on Good Friday. And uh, I don't know how many of us have really understood the import of the sentences here. But let's look at it today. You see here, when we read this short passage, it shows us the courage of Jesus. You see here, Jesus is out there in the open. He is not hiding behind any tree. He is not trying to cover himself up. No, he is there out in the open. And so when they come to search for him, he is there standing right in front of them. That shows the courage of Jesus. It's such glorious defiance. He's standing and asking, whom do you seek? And he says, I am he. I am the one you're looking for. You see, so much so, they fall to the ground. That's what John says. When they hear his voice, they fall to the ground. That is the authority of Jesus. You see, one man army standing all alone. And uh, he stands tall. And uh, hundreds of them with equipment, with weapons, all against him, against this simple carpenter. And Jesus is able to face them without any fear. It is they who fall to the ground, not Jesus. You see? So there flowed from Jesus a certain authority. And uh, this is something so beautiful. Even in the face of persecution, Jesus is able to stand up and have that kind of authority. It also shows us that Jesus chose to die. Jesus was not a coward who was trying to run away from all these people. Jesus was there and he said, I am the one you're looking for. He says, take me and go. He was ready to die. In fact, he says, you know, if you've come to arrest me, leave these people alone. Take me and go. So that also shows us that Jesus was so protective of his people. It shows his protective love for his disciples. He says, take me and go. 
leave these men alone. You know, such a wonderful person that he was. You know, he doesn't want to take others along with him and say, okay, okay, these fellows are also part of my gang. You know, I want some company. No, he says, take me. I am the one you're looking for. Let these. Jesus is obedient to the father because he says, shall I not drink the cup which the father has given me? So, you know, Jesus is fully obedient to the father. You know, whatever be your courage, when actually when you're going to suffer, you know, at that moment, you may want to run away. That is our human nature. But Jesus, no, even at this moment, is able to say, Shall I not drink the cup which the father has given me? Total obedience to the father, even in the face of persecution and death. He stands confident, knowing that the father has asked him to go ahead. Why should I fall back? No, let me obey. Jesus is here ready to do the father's will. <clears throat> And we also see at the end here the courage of Peter. Imagine there are so many men here, so many soldiers. And although there are so many and Peter is all alone, Peter takes the sword and cuts off the servant's right ear. You know, all the Gospels, Matthew, uh, Luke, Mark, all of them, they talk about this. And Luke especially will say, after Peter cut off his ear, Jesus heals the man's ear. Luke alone will say that. But John doesn't talk about the healing. John mentions the slave's name as Malchus. John knows him. But John doesn't talk about the healing for some reason. Luke talks about it. And you see here the courage of Peter. You know, He is so uh, taken up by all that is happening that in his impulsive nature, he cuts off the ear of this man. He is not worried about what will happen when he does this act. You know, all the others can pounce on him and kill him. But Peter is not afraid, you see. We call Peter a coward. But see Peter here, so strong, standing tall like Jesus. And he cuts off the man's ear. He says, how can you do this to my master? You know, his immediate reaction, he cuts off his ear. That's the most he can do. And Jesus, of course, immediately chides him and he says, Peter, put it back. Put it back in its sheath. You know, and then he will say in another gospel, you know, he who takes the sword will die by the sword. He says, don't do it. This is not what my father wants me to do. If he wants, he could have sent a thousand angels. But no, this is not what you and I are supposed to do. He says, we are following the path of peace. Therefore, put the sword back. Is Jesus' instruction to Peter. <clears throat> so here in this little uh, passage, we have so many beautiful things that tell us about who Jesus is in the face of persecution. You know, when many people, many preachers, when they talk, you know, it's so beautiful to listen to them. But how many of them really walk the talk? Here we see Jesus in the face of suffering, in the face of persecution, standing tall, walking the talk, ready to obey the Father, ready to do His will, and not afraid of anything that is going to happen to Him. That is what we see in the person of Jesus. So beautiful, and it's also a beautiful reminder for us as to how you and I should be in the face of persecution, not to run away, but to stand up for Jesus and say, yes, Lord, I know that you are with me. So now we come to the second part where Jesus is taken to Annas. And this passage also will tell us a lot of things about what is really going to happen in this trial, and what kind of trial it is. So we read from John chapter eight, 18, verse 12. I read to you 12 to 14 and again 19 to 24 because this whole thing talks about the trial the whole uh, trial before Annas 
So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was his who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Annas then bound, sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now in this passage, we have here the story that John tells us about Annas. We must first of all know that this Annas was a notorious character. You see, we, we know that uh, the Jews appointed high priests who were on the throne till they died. This is how it was before the Romans took over. After the Romans came, what happened was these fellows had to win this position of high priest only by bribing and cheating the Romans. And the highest bidder got this position of the chief priest. And this Anas had always been winning this post because he was a very rich man. He had made money unjustly and he was the one who was always able to win this position of chief priest and not only him, all his sons and now even his son-in-law was the high priest. Now currently it was Caiaphas was the high priest and yet they take him to Annas. Why? You see this whole thing is so illegal. Although he is not the high priest now, although his son-in-law is the high priest, Annas is also there in power because he was the high priest. He was the main high priest who was there for many years. And so Annas wants to meet Jesus. Why? We'll see. Because Annas was the one <clears throat> who was owning this entire place in the temple. All the shops outside the temple and all the shops inside the temple, which is called the court of the Gentiles. You remember Jesus driving out the traders and the money changers inside the temple. Now, this was all inside the temple in a place called the court of the Gentiles, where all the non-Jews would come and stand and pray. Although it was not directly inside the temple, it was the outer court. That was the place where they could stand and pray peacefully. But they could no longer do that because this was completely occupied by these traders. And Jesus overturns their tables. And all these shops belong to Annas. So much so, this whole thing was called the bazaars of Annas. Can you imagine? They were called the bazaars of Annas. They all belong to this one man. And when Jesus overturned the tables and threw these fellows out, he was directly hitting out at Annas, hitting at his money. So now you can imagine how infuriated Annas must have been to know that this one rabbi is trying to stand up against him. And from that day onwards, he must have been waiting to do away with Jesus and now came his chance. And so here is Annas who was hated by the people because he was a very wicked man. And what is more, you see, the kind of cheating he did, just one example, 
See the turtle doves, the lambs, all that were sold were also sold outside the temple in all these shops and they were sold at a very nominal price. Just to give you an example, these turtle doves, let's say, were sold for 70 rupees a pair. OK, now <clears throat> if you took these doves inside the temple, the officer there, there will be an inspector there who will inspect it and somehow they will find some blemish in this and they'll say, no, 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 we can't offer this. You buy something that is approved by the temple. And that is sold inside the temple in this court of the Gentiles, which belong to Anas. And so when somebody went to buy it there, the same pair of turtle doves will cost 750 rupees. So where is 40 rupees and where is 750 rupees? You know, <clears throat> it is more than six times the price, isn't it? Uh, sorry, it is more than 20 times the price, almost 20 times. 40 and... Yeah, almost 20 times the price. So there is no comparison. And the same with the lambs. You know, you buy a lamb outside, they'll find some spot or some blemish on the lamb. And you'll have to buy one inside, which is almost 20 times the price. Imagine poor people, you know, all their livelihood would go on this single offering. And here was this Anas amassing all this wealth. And again, money changes. You know, when you exchange money in a bank, you pay a small commission. And uh, people who come from other countries, Jews who would come from neighboring countries, cannot put their currency into the temple. You have to use the temple currency. And for that, you have to exchange it here at these money changers. And they again charged an exorbitant commission, very high commission. And so you lost a lot of money to these traders. And yet people, because they knew it was the temple, they would do anything. They had to, they had no other go but to go and change their money because they had to make an offering. So that is how this Annas was amassing his wealth. And Jesus hit him in the stomach, hit him where it really uh, affected him. And so here was Annas who was doing an unjust trial. And so this whole trial, if you see, is a mockery of justice. First of all, we understand that this was done at night, totally illegal. Secondly, it was done not in the Sanhedrin, but it was done in another place, probably in his house and again illegal. And thirdly, very importantly, what Jesus will argue here is <clears throat> The one who is on trial should not be questioned. That is the first thing. Whom you should question is the witnesses, not the one who is on trial. But Annas is talking directly to Jesus. He is not supposed to talk to him. And, uh, you know, he is not supposed to make any judgment because the law itself says that you cannot inflict the penalty of death upon a sinner by his own confession. So you cannot inflict the penalty of death on the sinner by his own confession. You have to get witnesses who will talk against him and then he can be stoned to death if he's done something wrong. So that was the law. But here is Annas who is questioning Jesus directly. And so Jesus is saying, you know, I've spoken to everyone. Uh, I have nothing in secret. Don't ask me. Ask those who have heard me. What is he saying? In effect, he's saying, why are you questioning me? Isn't it against the law? Are you not supposed to have witnesses? Are you not supposed to ask them? Why are you doing something that is against the law? That is exactly what Jesus is saying. And what is the response he gets? An officer strikes him on the cheek. Imagine, for asking a proper question, for asking what is right, Jesus is slapped on the cheek. He struck, John says, he struck by this officer with his hand. Is this how you answer the high priest? In effect, he's saying, are you teaching the high priest what to do? Doesn't he know the law? 
See, the whole thing is a mockery. Jesus is speaking the truth. He's saying the right thing. But you see how unjust they are and how they treat Jesus. He's saying, you're trying to teach us. You're trying to teach the high priest. You think he doesn't know the law? You see how they conduct this whole trial. The whole thing is done unjustly. Again, Jesus responds to him by saying, if I have spoken wrongly, tell me what I said. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? You see, it is Jesus who said, if someone strikes you on one cheek, show him the other. And here is Jesus when he is struck, he says, why do you strike me? You know, Jesus would always stand up for what is right. Jesus doesn't say, you know, just be like a fool and get struck. No. He says, when he says, show the other cheek, he says, don't resist. But at the same time, Jesus is, say, is saying, stand up for what is right. If someone is being unjust to you, you have the right to question that person. And that is what Jesus is doing now. He says, if I have said something wrong, tell me. But if I have spoken the truth, why do you strike me? See, Jesus is a man who had self-respect. And so here he is able to question this man. He says, why do you touch me? Why do you hit me? Why do you strike me? So even when he is on trial, Jesus is able to stand up for himself. He has respect for himself. He has that self-respect, that self-worth. And Jesus will never lose that dignity. And so he's able to stand up and ask that question. And you know, this man will have to answer this question in his heart. Remember, he'll have to answer that question in his heart because Jesus wants him to realize that what he is doing is wrong. Jesus doesn't meekly say, okay, do what you want. No, Jesus is not there standing as a coward. No, no, no. Jesus is standing tall. He is still standing tall. He knows all that is happening. He knows everything is unjust. But he will stand up for what is right and he will speak up. He is very bold. He is very courageous. He will speak up. He knows the penalty is death and yet he will speak up. See, in the book of Ecclesiastes we read, there is a time for speaking. There is a time to be silent. And here is a moment when you must speak and Jesus will not be silent. He will speak. See? So Jesus, you know, knew that there was no hope. There was no chance of justice at all in this court. Because it was not a court of justice. And yet, and yet, Jesus was able to speak for himself. You see? So, this is something we see in Jesus. And we also see how wicked a person can be. You see this man who had such hatred and wickedness in his heart, how he used this opportunity to kill Jesus. You see? And uh, we do not know how terrible his death must have been. You know, this man must have had a horrible death because there was so much of hatred and sin in his heart. This man, you know, couldn't have had a very happy death. And uh, imagine the son of God, the sinless one, is brought to trial in an unjust court. And that is what happens to all those who are just. For anyone who stands up for what is right, this is what you should expect. You know, the world cannot tolerate good people. And so Jesus is taken on trial and he is condemned to death. See? So that is the story with Annas. And now we come to the story of Peter, who the world calls a coward. But we should actually see who Peter really is. As I just told you in the previous passage, Peter was not really a coward. Peter was the only one who stood up for Jesus. When everybody was there against him, Simon Peter was able to draw that sword Imagine the courage he must have had to draw that sword and cut off his ear. He didn't even threaten to cut off his ear. He just cut it off. You know, he had that kind of anger in his heart, that boldness in his heart, and he was able to chop off that ear. He was so filled with wrath because his master was arrested. You know, 
So Peter was not a coward. He was someone who was so brave, who was able to stand up for Jesus. So we have to look at the real Peter. Now let's see in this verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Now most probably this other disciple is John. Okay. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus while Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the maid who kept the door and brought Peter in. So you see, uh, while all the others ran away, Peter did not run away. See, Peter wanted to be close to Jesus. He wanted to see what was happening to his master. Therefore, we shouldn't call him a coward. Yes, Peter failed. But then you see, Peter really loved Jesus. And so he goes along with John. He somehow says, let me be close to my master. Let me see what happens to him. I cannot run away from him. I can't be somewhere else when my master is being punished. So he goes along and John takes him. Fortunately, John knows the high priest. You see, probably they say from tradition that uh, John's father was a seller of salt fish. And so he was the one who was supplying salt fish to the high priest's family. And therefore, uh, John must have been the one who was doing all the deliveries. And so John was known to the whole family, to all the servants and to everyone. And so that is why when Jesus was arrested, John was able to enter the high priest's house. And he also got permission for Peter to go along with him. Okay, so now the maid who kept the door said to Peter, Are not you also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. So you see, Peter is afraid. Peter, on the one hand, wants to be close to Jesus. And on the other hand, he doesn't want to get into trouble. So he uh, openly denies and says, I'm not associated with Jesus. I'm not even his disciple. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, are not you also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. So second time, you know, somebody in the crowd kind of recognizes him and says, you also look like a Galilean. No? So I think you are part of this man's group. He says, no, 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 I am not. So second time, you see, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative, a kinsman, of the man whose ear Peter had cut off asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? So this man doesn't say you cut off his ear, but he recognizes Peter having been very standing very close to Jesus. And he's seen him in the garden and he says, I think I recognize you. Weren't you the one who was with Jesus in the garden? Peter again denied it. And at once the cock crowed. Third time Peter says no. No, 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 no. I'm not connected with this man, Jesus. Peter is cowed down. See, Peter is filled with fear. When it really comes to, you know, standing up for Jesus, now he's filled with fear. And the cock crows. Now, this cock crow, let me explain. Uh, they say that in Jerusalem, they did not have cocks, especially near the temple, because... These cocks were not permitted to be anywhere near the temple. And also, it is very unlikely that the cock crowed exactly at that time in the morning. So, there is another meaning for this cock crow. You know, you see, in, in, the, in the Roman temple, the, the change of guards, you know, the temple timing, the change of guards, uh, the whole watch, you know, the night watch, was divided into four parts. The watch of the night was divided into four parts. That is, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., that is, uh, 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock was the first watch. 9 to 12, midnight was the second watch. 12 to 3 was the third watch. And 3 to 6 was the fourth watch. And now, at the third watch, 
that is at uh, three o'clock in the morning, there will be a change of guard. Now this change of guard at three o'clock in the morning was called cock crow. So there was a siren that was blowing and uh, it was called the cock crow. Now that is most probably what Jesus was referring to. The change of guard or the cock crow by the Roman soldiers, uh, the blowing of the trumpet uh, was called the cock crow. And so at this three o'clock in the morning, by the time all this conversation happened, this uh, change of guard happened and the cock crowed. And immediately Peter remembers, yes, Jesus had already spoken about this and he feels really, really sad. And now in Peter's heart, you must remember, Peter, although feels terribly upset that he has denied Jesus, Peter is a man who quickly wants to make up. He wants to come back to Jesus. You see, Peter wants to redeem himself. Peter will definitely want to redeem himself. He is not like Judas who goes and hangs himself. He is not like Judas who is filled with remorse. No, rather Peter repents for the wrong he has done. He really repents and he weeps bitterly. He says, how did I do this to my master? Because Peter loved Jesus very sincerely. Yes, Peter was a coward at this moment. And I'm sure most of us would have cowed down in the same situation. We would have also denied Jesus. But remember, Peter wanted to redeem himself. Peter was not really a coward because Peter was the one who stood up with Jesus Peter was the only one who was able to be with Jesus when the others ran away. And Peter also knew that his master will forgive him. And so Peter wants to redeem himself. And what does he do? He weeps bitterly. You know, things may not have gone very well with Peter. You know, after he denied him, the story must have gone around that how Jesus said when the cock crows, you know, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. And when the story went around, people would have made, you know, a lot of gossip about this. And when Peter was walking, you know, they would have imitated the crowing of the cock. And as Peter walked, they must have done cock, 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 just to make fun of him. And all this must have really hurt Peter, you know. So that was Peter. But yet, you know, Peter came out of all this. He began to realize that, you know, his love for the master was so great that all this did not really matter. Yes, he denied his master. Yes, that is true. But then what is important, the real Peter was not the one who denied Jesus. It was not the real Peter. You know, the real Peter was the one who showed his loyalty to Jesus in the upper room. When Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples, Peter was the one who said, No, Lord, you should never wash my feet. Peter was the one who drew the sword out in that moonlight evening and cut off the slaves ear. It was the real Peter who was able to be with Jesus when everyone ran away. But it was not the real Peter who denied Jesus. It was a Peter who was filled with fear temporarily who denied Jesus. And Jesus knew this. Jesus knew that the real Peter was the one who was really loyal to him. And this Jesus forgives Peter. And he says, don't worry, Peter, you are forgiven. And Peter knew this, that his Lord, his master had forgiven him. And Peter would continue to be faithful to him and he would give up his life for Jesus. You know, my dear friends, this is what you and I are called to be like Peter to stand up for Jesus and be loyal to him. Probably like Peter at times we would have denied Jesus. Probably there are times when we are also filled with fear when it comes to standing up for the values of the kingdom when it needs to really when we really need to stand up for Jesus. But remember Jesus really knows who we are deep down. He knows that we are sincere. He knows that we really love him. 
And so Jesus is not the one to point a finger at us and say, hey, you betrayed me, you denied me. No. But rather Jesus would look at us and say, my son, my daughter, I love you. And so today, as we look at Peter, we're also reminded of our own frail nature at, of how at times we can deny Jesus. We can probably, you know, uh, at times, knows that we are with him, that we will ultimately stand up for him. And like Peter, we can redeem ourselves and go back to Jesus and know that we have someone who always loves us. You see, Jesus' love for Jesus, Jesus' love for Peter was greater than Peter's act of denial. This is what we should remember. And here is Jesus today with us, wanting to forgive us of all our past wanting to love us as we are. And so this story reminds us of how such a wonderful lover, such a wonderful person we have as our savior. And no matter how far we go away from him, no matter how much we have done for Jesus against him, Jesus will still love us. And Jesus will still take us back into his warm embrace. This gives us hope. This gives us courage to continue to walk with him and say, Lord, I'm sorry, but Lord, I know that you still love me. When Jesus finally says, Peter, do you love me more than this, more than these? Peter will be able to say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know, Peter had this genuine love for Jesus and he was able to say, you, you know everything. You know that I love you. And today we can also turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know that I love you more than anything else, more than anyone else.